Hi. Uh, our next speaker is a former preacher's son, a formal evangelical who uh, broke free and enjoys going around the country talking about his experience. He's also a writer and a blogger. Uh, he lives in uh, Lock Haven, PA, with his wife and two daughters. Please welcome Timothy Havner. you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I would have been one of those people that stood out in the street preaching with my youth group, uh, trying to save you from hell. I used to believe in the power of God and His Holy Spirit. I used to believe that I had a relationship, not a religion. I used to believe a lot of things. I used to be an idiot. <laughs> Fables should be taught as fables, myths as myths, and miracles as poetic fantasies. To teach superstitions as truth is the most terrible thing. The child mind accepts it and believes them, and only through great pain and perhaps tragedy can he be, in after years, relieved of them. Hypatia of Alexandria. I was born to a Christian family. Uh, my father is a minister in the Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, some of you may have heard of that denomination. Um, my name is Timothy Lee. My parents chose that name deliberately because Timothy means serving God and Lee means in the field. So they had the idea that I would become a missionary and serve God uh, either here or overseas. I, uh, I was surrounded by religious people my entire life. I never met an atheist until I was an adult. Didn't even really know that they existed for all I know. Uh, for all I knew, everybody was a Christian. Everybody was uh, a believer around me. I, I didn't have any outside influences, and my parents made very sure that everything that I was given was Christian or amplified the message of Christianity in my life. Um, I was in public school until about sixth grade, and then my parents put me into Christian school. And when I went to Christian school, I uh, got my biology textbook, and in my biology textbook was uh, Noah's Ark. <laughs> so, and the only experience I had with uh, evolution or science as we know it is uh, through opposition research that they would put into the text and uh, demonizing evolution, uh, making me fear uh, science, real science, making me fear critical thought and fear uh, what I now know is the truth. Um, when I was a teenager, my family moved to Florida, and when we moved to Florida, I had my first experience with charismatic Christianity. And I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with charismatic Christianity, but it's kind of like Jesus on crack. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a whole different world than normal Christianity. There's a lot more emotion, a lot more um, intensity. It's, it, it's a whole different uh, realm of, 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 of Christianity than, than uh, probably what T Teresa went through. Um, when, I, uh, when I got involved with this youth group, when we moved down there, we went to this uh, revival in Brownsville. Have any of you ever heard of the Brownsville revival? You've, you've heard? It was a, a church where this, what they call the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, had shown itself and people were falling down on the floor and doing all kinds of things. And um, our youth group went there, and we would go there and we would stand and worship for hours. I mean, can you imagine sitting in a room or standing in a room and just singing and praying for like hours on end? That's what we did. You get hyped up with this emotion and, and you get so sucked into it. And, it. and it felt good. I liked it. I enjoyed it. It was something that... Uh, 
that, that wasn't a negative thing for me at that time. And uh, one of, at one point during one of the services, the, you, would, you could go down and get prayed for by these men of God who had the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, have any of you ever heard of Michael Brown, the fundamentalist preacher, Michael Brown? He was one of the ministers there that was preaching at, at the, uh, the revival. And I went down, and my group went down, and we all got prayed for. And, um, you know, people were falling down the floor, slaying the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. It's where someone gets prayed for, and they, God's power hits them, and they, well, it's not God's power, but they fall down. And I go, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I, go, I wanted to experience it. And I, I wanted to get to feel God's power inside me so that I couldn't stand anymore. And some of you may think that's odd. It's alien or born to you to, to want to experience something like that. But for me, it was very real. And, and uh, anyway, Michael Brown comes over, he prays over my group. Everybody falls down and comes over to me and he lays his hand on me. And when he laid his hand on me, he kind of started to push. <laughs> I wouldn't go down. <laughs> I said, I actually said, I said a prayer in my head. God, if you want me to fall down, you're going to have to work, do harder than this. <laughs> and... Uh, after uh, like what seemed like an eternity, he just looks at me in the eyes real deeply. He goes, keep searching. I did. After that um, experience, uh, I, got back, I went back and uh, got involved with missions work. Uh, our youth group went to South Africa. And I got involved with YWAM after that. Got involved with missions. And... Um, short-term missions in different uh, Mexico, here in the United States, I did some work. Um, one of the things uh, that's, uh, that's difficult is when you look back now as being an atheist, uh, there's a lot of experiences or things that you did, especially as a believer in that type of Christianity, that you just, you just, you just face ball. It's just, it's, it's embarrassing. Uh, one of those experiences was I was at a friend's house. His parents had a minister from another country that were there visiting, and we had like a prayer group there, and, and they found that I couldn't speak in tongues. <laughs> and uh, they, 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 I said, I'd like to speak in tongues. And they go, well, okay, let's do it. So we sat down in a chair, and everybody prayed over me. They got some oil out and put it on my forehead and did all kinds of like ceremonial things, walking around, praising, worshiping. I was sitting in that chair for probably like 45 minutes to an hour, waiting for God's spirit to come up in me and for me to speak in tongues. And the guy that was there was kind of coaching me. He was standing over me. He was saying, uh, come on, just, just let the spirit flow through you. And you know, that's, and I, and I started to speak in tongues. And Looking back on that now, when I first had that experience, I can tell you now that I was faking it, but then I felt like it was real. And the, the thing about these experiences and why the people that are believers can't see the bullshit right in front of them is because you want to believe it. You want it to be true. You, you want there to be miracles. You want... God to be real and his spirit to be real. And uh, after that, uh, you know, after the missionary work and everything, I, uh, I was also involved in a church down in Florida, a charismatic church, and uh, a very popular charismatic church. And uh, I began to start to see things in the movement. Uh, a preacher who lived in a million dollar mansion with some of the poorest people in town going to his church. And that kind of made me scratch my head a little bit. And uh, I was also had some, some negative experiences within, um, within, my, within ministry, uh, like, you know, about some of the term of spiritual abuse. And uh, that kind of put me off a little bit. But through all of it, I would, just, I would come back and I would say, God, these, these people are imperfect. You're not. You're perfect. And, and I just would brush it off and say, that's not you, Jesus, and 
that's not what you're like. And I would just, I just keep plow ahead, ignoring all the contradictions, ignoring all the hypocrisy I saw in front of me. And uh, I don't think there was any like, there was never like a moment where I said, I'm an atheist. Uh, it, like there was no conversion moment for me. It was kind of a gradual process. But one of the things that, that really uh, started me on that road to skepticism was a sermon I heard about Paul and the Bereans. It's from Acts 17.11, where Paul is admiring the Bereans for the fact that when they came to, when he came to them and preached them, he, they didn't just accept what he said, they researched it and looked into it. And that night when I was praying, I said, God, I'm going to challenge my beliefs because if they're worth believing in, by the time I get done challenging these beliefs and questioning them, I will come to the truth. And Teresa mentioned Bart Ehrman. I like, he's one of my favorite authors. And he says there's a, there's a, in fundamentalist Christianity, they teach you to, to, to admire the truth, to search for the truth, to look for the truth. And many times that leads people away from faith. If you genuinely look for and that's what happened to me. And over the over that uh, that, that there was like a seven year period when I was 25 years old that 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 happened. And I started to read different books. Didn't read any atheist books. Didn't even really know about the atheist movement. I'm one of those people that was just out there on my own trying to figure things out. Didn't have any support from any. Surrounded by religious people, uh, I I felt alone. And uh, that fueled the fear of uh, challenging my beliefs and uh, moving on uh, with my skepticism. And that's why it took me seven years to come to a realization that I'm an atheist. Um, one of the uh, key moments in my life, I think, looking back, was my grandmother. She was a uh, Pentecostal Christian. She prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and believed that God could speak to her. She believed that God came to her and said that she was going to see his return. She got cancer. And uh, the cancer went away and then it came back. And when she died, she died in her chair in her house with a Bible on her lap. At the time of the funeral, Everybody was saying how wonderful that was, that she was at peace with God and she went to heaven. And at the time of the funeral, I was still semi-religious, so I went along with it and said, oh yeah, she's in a better place. But looking back on it, I, what I see is a young, beautiful woman, lovely person, caring person, taken and taught these fables as truth, these myths as fact. And... I don't see a peaceful moment. I see the mind of a beautiful person twisted to the point where she believes she could hear the voice of an imaginary being dying, praying to an empty ceiling. And, and looking back, I think that that, that that was one of the most powerful things that kind of made me question my faith. Have any of you ever uh, heard of uh, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames? The, the, some of you here. When I was uh, when I was a Christian, I helped uh, volunteer for a production of that play. And what it is is it's it's a stage production. It goes around different churches, and usually people from the church get involved, and they do scenarios where they show people going to heaven or hell. And one of the scenarios that I remember was. Uh, a young boy and his father on an uh, airplane, they simulated an airplane ride, and the father was uh, was a sinner and didn't believe in God. And they died in a plane crash. And the, uh, the father, upon dying, is dragged off to hell, screaming and kicking and yelling, to make it as dramatic as possible. And now there's children in the audience. And there's a kid on stage playing his son. 
and the kid's crying and, and upset that his dad's being dragged to hell. And after that happens, then the boy, Jesus comes out and hugs the boy and everybody cheers and he goes to heaven. Now think about the impact that has on the mind of a child. The fear and the indoctrination that that, 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 that has. If your belief requires that level of fear and indoctrination, that alone should make you question what value that belief has and whether it's worth holding on to. What, what angers me the most, I think, about religion, about my experience with religion, about uh, the people that I love that are still believers, is what it steals from me. What it stole from my grandmother, what it's stealing from my mother and father, what it stole from me. It steals your identity of who you are as a person. It tells you you are evil, corrupt, that you aren't good enough, and that you need God to be a, a better person. It strips away the very essence of who we are as human beings and replaces it with an impossible, impossible uh, reality. And I, I, one of the things that was, uh, when I was coming out of my religion and coming out of Christianity, was uh, I was going through a period where I was feeling so alone. Felt like there was nobody out there who knew what I was going through. And then I happened to watch Seth Andrews' Oklahoma Free Thought speech, the Thinking Atheist, and that really spoke to me. It, it made me feel like I, find I wasn't alone, and that I actually, there were other people out there that had been through what I'd been through, experienced what I experienced. And, uh, and, and that finally gave me the courage to admit I'm an atheist and to come out to my family. And uh, I wish I could say that my parents rejected me, because I think that would be easier. But they love me. They genuinely love me. They care about me. They think I'm going to hell. <laughs> my dad, when I admit, told him I was an atheist, I, I, he came to me in tears. And the, gen, the emotion was genuine. And and he said, Tim, Jesus loves you. And I could see the love in his eyes and the care he had for me. But I had, I, I just, it, it, it's, it's so difficult to deal with that with parents who you know love, love you and you love them. But they're so focused, not on their relationship with you as a child and a parent, but it, it, this, it takes a backseat to them having to save you from this imaginary place of punishment and suffering. And that's another thing that religion steals from you. It steals you relationships with each other. It steals people. It steals family members. Because many times you can't have a conversation. You have to watch what you say. Everything's affected. And, I, and I, you know, I'm still working through that myself. But I know that there's a lot of others out there who have problems with family members. And, and, and uh, I think that... Uh, I think that we can, uh, through the support of the community here, with the atheist community, that the one thing I've noticed is that when I tell my story, when I talk to people about this, I have people tell me, I went through that. I, that's the same thing I went through. I experienced that. And that alone has enough power to help people who feel alone and, 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 and lost in this journey that they're taking from belief to non-belief. And I think it's an important thing. Because it was, I, I don't know if I, I would have been able to admit that I was an atheist or come out as an atheist if there weren't other people out there that were supportive and that I could identify with. And I just want to leave you with something here. I, I know I'm probably not using up all my time, but. No, but you can Yeah. Um, this is something I wrote the other day about religion, about my feelings toward religion. And I just want to leave you with this. Abrahamic religion is a strange and fascinating world where there exists moral absolutes that an allegedly infallible deity can violate with impunity 
committing offenses that dwarf the worst atrocities of mankind. The God of Abraham is given license by Scripture to do all the worst of what we define as evil, and yet he called loving, kind, and good. This creates a culture that worships the power to do evil, but calls it good. It perverts the very essence of our humanity and dulls it with ignorance and brutality. This is not goodness, mercy, or forgiveness you are worshiping. You are bowing to the perception of a superior supernatural power, nothing else. This is king worship, it's slavery, it's the tyranny of the mind, and the last shackle we must loosen to set our species free from the ignorance of our past. children because uh, you're dealing with the parents and and the, and all the factors that come with that but uh, one of the things that uh, the mayor said earlier kind of offended me a little bit but uh, I don't think she meant to um, when, when she said that we don't force our beliefs on anyone you do children they don't get a choice I wasn't given a choice. I wasn't allowed to watch the Smurfs on television when I was a kid because it had a wizard in it. I mean, it, it they shelter you to the point, and that bubble was perfect analogy that Teresa had, because you just, you're so sheltered in this little bubble of, of reality that, that you don't see anything else outside of it. And I don't know really what the answer is to that with children, because if the parents want to teach their kids that and do that to them, how are you going to stop that? And maybe, maybe the answer is education and, uh, and, and working with kids in school. Not to push any particular belief on them, but to teach them critical thinking. If we focus more on critical thinking in school and teach it to kids at a younger age and, and, and focus on that, I think that could have an impact to help them make decisions on their own rather than just take what's force-fed to them. I hope that answers it. You mentioned uh, your parents. Uh, you're still getting along with them, I assume. Are they still trying to convert you back? Do they, uh, do they send you literature? Do they, are they still working on you? Every once in a while, yeah. But I think they've kind of accepted this isn't just a phase. But uh, my dad and I go back and forth sometimes on Facebook. The other day he posted a, he has an eye problem. And he, uh, he posted that he thanked God for his healing power after he went to a trained surgeon that gave him back part of his sight. And, I, and everybody's all praise God, and I just put praise signs in, his, in the comments. I just left it at that. But, uh, but yeah, my, 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 my dad believes I'm going to hell. And, and uh, you know, you hear so many times of the rejection and the violence of, of believers towards um, Atheist. And that is true, to some, so, but there's also an aspect of people that genuinely believe this and care for other people. And when they're coming to you as an atheist and doing some of the things they do, saying some of the most stupid and ridiculous things they say, it's because they think that they're helping you and they love and care about you. They don't want you to go to hell. Who wants anybody they know or, or, or love and care about to go to hell and burn forever? 
And, but, but see, that's, that's another thing about what it steals from people, it takes their humanity from them. The natural sense of human decency that we all have and twists it into this, uh, <coughs> this ridiculous notion that we have to save people from an imaginary place of punishment. It's, uh, and that, and that, that's what, I, when, my, when I talked to my dad, I told him, I said, Dad, I realize you love me. Mom, I realize you love me, but I, can't you just love me for being your son? And, and, and leave it at that? But I don't think that the belief won't let them do that, so I look forward to more attempts in the future. <laughs> As they move past the, uh, oh, he'll come back stage. Because my parents, that was the first thing, well, he'll come back. And, uh, I, I think I, five years of having come back. It's such a, it's, it's, you, see, you feel so conflicted inside uh, with that. Like, because I know my mom is praying for me. I know my dad is praying for me. I know other family members are praying for me. And it, it, I, I broke my parents' hearts. And, but that's something I have to take as a consequence of standing up for what I believe in. And I wrote a letter to my parents when I came out and I said, I told my dad, Dad, when you preached on Sundays, you didn't care about whose toes you stepped on. You wanted to speak the truth to people. How can I do less? And Mom, you taught me that uh, to be a strong person and think for myself. She had the intention that I would think about religion and God and be a Christian, but I took that lesson and, and utilized it a different way. So I try I tried to tell them and express to them, you didn't fail me. You succeeded. But, but they just don't see it that way. So were you a good kid? I mean... Oh. <laughs> I was a, I never did drugs or anything like that. I was just mischievous, had some hyperactive ADD type things. But uh, other than that, I mean, uh, I was just a normal kid growing up in the church, and uh, and I never even I never even actually thought to challenge my beliefs uh, until I was 25. I mean, I never even had a moment where I said there couldn't be a God or there might not be a God or maybe I should question this stuff because you're in that bubble. Yeah. You just don't even think to look outside of it. I'm sure they're holding on hope that they'll come back. Good luck to them. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I might have missed it a little bit earlier because of, uh, you know, doing organizer things. But uh, do you have siblings? Yes. I actually have a brother in seminary. He's oh. going to Geneva over in... Um, must be a, to become a Presbyterian minister. Actually, I, it's funny to bring up because I had a big fallout with my brother over Thanksgiving. Him and his wife, he, uh, we were talking about Deuteronomy, debating some of the nastier pieces of scripture in the Old Testament. And uh, we got to this point in the conversation where he, he just turned to me and goes, Tim, you never wanted to believe. And I looked at him, and I actually had tears in my eyes, and I looked at him because it was really emotional for me. I said, don't you ever tell me that. I sat on my knees for hours when I was doubting, praying for hours on end. I begged God to say, do something to keep me from going down this path. If you want me to believe, you're going to have to do something. I, I spent hours in prayer and wrestling with my doubts over that. And for him to say that really offended me. And to him, it was the response was, well, we have to understand we need to believe that for, for, for us, for our beliefs. You can't have been a believer according to what we believe. It's all about them. It's all about what they believe and the contradictions and the realities that, that are very real and emotional for me mean nothing to them. And, 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 that, and that kind of hurts. Uh, and, and it's another thing that you have to deal with or I have to deal with of having religious family members. But luckily my sister's... Uh, she calls herself an agnostic, but then I have another younger sister who's been indoctrinated um, with the same curriculums, the creationism and things like that. We were in Burger King and uh, we were talking about horses because she has horses and we just brought up horse evolution. I said, did you know that horses evolved in America and then they migrated and then we brought them here, we're bringing them back home. My mom 
my mom had a fit that I was talking to my sister about that. She says, don't you try to push your beliefs on her. I was like, I'm just telling her a scientific <laughs> fact. <laughs> but these, those are just the little things that, that make it hard because you have to watch what you say because every little thing could possibly offend. But one of the things that really irritates me is I have to walk in eggshells, but they can say whatever they want about me. And they don't have to worry about offending me, but I have to worry about offending them. And that creates a disparity in the relationship that just, it's hard to deal with. Like, you have to understand, I'm up here talking about this, and I'm still working through these things, as many others are. It's, it's, it's very hard, the dynamics with having a family of believers. I mean, I have my uncle, two uncles that are ministers. I have an aunt who's the minister's wife. I have cousins who are missionaries. I mean, my family religion is pretty much their whole world. And uh, and even, I, I, have, I am glad that they didn't take such a negative impact to me. But I, like I said, I think sometimes that would be easier if we just cut it off rather than have to uh, deal with the fact that uh, that I know they love me, but religion is twisting their minds and their, into a pretzel over over uh, their beliefs and how they respond to me. So at family gatherings, and uh, are, are you ever afraid to just say, oh, I'm not going to show up this year because... No, I don't do that, but every once in a while I add a little sarcasm, like say abracadabra over the meal. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. I heard a lot of this on your YouTube story, and it's, your story gets better and better and is dramatic. But I have to admit, I don't get it. I'm like everybody. I was born an atheist. I happen to be <laughs> born into a family that didn't change me. So my spiritual journey is kind of a boring straight line. And it, it makes me cry to hear about your, your grandmother, but I don't... Let me take a quick, quick poll. How many of you are lifelong atheists that have never wavered? I think, I feel like we're lucky. Must be a quarter of us. Some other people really suffer with religion and escaping. And we've heard already today, we'll hear more about people that have changed their minds secretly, but they're deciding whether to come out. And they must be weighing things. They, they're almost certain they're going to lose their family and friends, maybe their job. And on the positive side, I guess there's integrity or they don't have to question. When I think of being inside the bubble, looking out at the choice, it's pretty heavy on staying in the bubble. And I don't, having not been through it, I'm curious to hear anybody's stories. I'd like to hear, if you had a quick answer, you were kind of in that position. What gives you the nerve to just throw away this big thing and say, well, this will be with hindsight worth something, or worth enough to justify what you know you're losing? I think that once you let facts in, and you start to genuinely question your beliefs, that it, it's all over. And you, and you have to make a choice to either uh, go down the road and keep challenging it, or you let the fear take over and stay in that comfort zone of belief. I mean, it's... <sighs> Uh, it's not something that I viewed as negative being a Christian when I was a Christian. Especially like the, the aspects of praise and worship and things like that. It felt pretty damn good. Well, dopamine rushed to my brain, you know. And the fact that, you know, I have I reworded one of my uh, the, the songs I was raised with as a child. You know, Jesus loves me this I you know, or my dopamine levels tell me so. <laughs> It is like a drug. You get addicted, and when you, it, it, and if you took, it's like taking a kid and giving them uh, crack when they're growing up, and it, it, it's really hard to break free from. And a lot of people don't. I don't know. I don't really don't. I, I don't really have an answer why I ended up becoming uh, an atheist. I just started researching, and I wanted to believe something that 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 I had learned myself and find an identity for myself that was apart from what I was just indoctrinated with. And I think, and when I started on that journey, I started out thinking, well, I'm just going to strengthen my faith. But what ended up happening was 
I ended up leaving faith. And I think that that's a natural effect of genuinely questioning your beliefs. And if we can somehow get Christians to do that. How? I don't think you can. You know, a lot of people take the compassionate approach, which is, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people take the compassionate approach where we should be respectful of each other's beliefs. And I think we should respect the right to believe, but I don't think we should respect religion. I don't think we, we should be obligated to. And shame are the best tools we have. And and the, the people, when I look back, at when I was debating atheists when I was a Christian, and I would, uh, you know, I'd call them jerks or assholes or whatever, you know, for being uh, daring to challenge my beliefs, I want to go back and hug those people. Because that's what made me start to question my own beliefs, was people challenging what I believe, making fun of it, mocking it, making me uh, consider that there's something else out there. So I don't think we should let up. I don't think we should. This idea of tolerance, I think, is is uh, is misused because you can, you know, Christians say hate the sinner or hate the sin and love the sinner. I hate the belief and love the believer. If they can do it, I can. So I think, uh, and I think that that's the best way to target it. I, I think just make them uncomfortable with it. Because if, if you have the truth on your side, no matter who says you're wrong, the facts will, will out themselves. The problem with religion is that it doesn't have facts. And it's, and it's full of holes. And, they, and, it's, and they meet the time when they have to actually defend their beliefs, a lot of them, when they start reading the Bible like I did, you start to see like those old stories that you're told, like Joshua and the wall of Jericho. You stop seeing a hero and you start seeing a genocidal maniac. And you stop seeing Josiah as a pious reformer and start seeing him as a theocratic dictator. You begin to see the dark side of the Bible that's glossed over when you're, uh, when you're growing up and given these Bible stories. And you begin to see that it's just an ancient book full of fables and myths and, uh, and horrible violence. And when you, start, when you can see that, uh, then I think that that makes the, that that can make the difference. I think that was it Isaac Asimov that said it. The Bible is the greatest force for atheism. Because <laughs> when you actually read that shit, <laughs> it kind of it's a wake up call. But, so having gone through everything that you have gone through in your, in your transition from belief to non belief, um, and where you are now with your family. Is there anything you would have done differently? And, and if so, what would that be? Hmm. That's a tough question. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, that I would uh, probably try to be more compassionate with the way I dealt with them. Because one of the things that, that I really, I, maybe some of you can sympathize with that come out of religion, you're not angry at first. You're not really a that angry when you first become an atheist. The more you start to think about what was taken from you, especially if you're indoctrinated as a child, what it did to you and what it stole from you, then you really start to get pissed off. And and um, and I, I my mom the other day the other day when I was visiting her she said, you know you hate how you were raised. You hate us. You hate everything we gave you. And that's just not true. But that's that's how they view it. And unfortunately, that's the, that's the destructive power of generational indoctrination. It just, it just keeps going and going and going. We need to break the cycle. And, and, and hopefully there'll be more people like myself, more people like Teresa that are out there that can do that. Because I think once that, that starts to, more of that starts to happen, more people are going to be encouraged to, to do the same thing and come out of it. But, uh, as far as what I would do different, I, I can't really answer that. Because I don't know if I would, but uh, that's, I just, I really, don't, I really don't have a solid answer for you. I'm sorry on that. It's, a, it's a, that's, that's something that I'll uh, have to ponder over.